Hey guys, it's Joel. Hello, welcome back to the channel and to another brutally honest review where today we're going to go really in depth and get underneath the skin of this. A lovely viewer of mine, David, has allowed me to have this for the day. It is, of course, a gorgeous Jaguar XK. Are, with a few subtle differences which we'll get into in a little bit. As you'll probably immediately notice this is a later model, it's the facelift which means it of course has a 5 litre supercharged engine and this particular one with the supercharger produces almost 600 horsepower but we'll get onto that a little bit later on. The thing that struck me though when I was researching for this car is that it kind of dawned on me that they don't make the XK anymore. In fact Jaguar don't really make a sports coupe with a two plus two configuration. They have the F-Type now, although they've discontinued that, I believe, and that never had two seats in the back. And so the XKR was essentially the last of that type of car for Jaguar as we know it today. And so these things are particularly special. For some as well, I know that the XK is the most beautiful Jaguar ever to be built. And I would kind of agree, but for me, I also really love the way that the F-Type looks, and I'll be very, very sad to see that car go. It's worth mentioning that this particular example is absolutely stunning. David, the owner of this car, has not actually had it very long, but tells me he's become completely besotted with it in his short time with the car. So as mentioned, this particular XK is of the facelift variety, which means it came with a five litre supercharged block, good for about 510 horsepower, and is an absolute mammoth of an engine, even unfettled, but this one, has had a few tweaks to the ECU and I'm told it produces around 100 horsepower. More than that, about 610, which, I mean, 510 wasn't enough, so why not add a bit more? But as well as the tweaks to the engine, this car has a couple of key differences as well. Uh, the owner of the car has put spacers on the wheels, so you can see they come out a little bit more to fill the arches. Aesthetically, very, very pleasing indeed, but also should help somewhat with the handling. And the owner has very kindly, I've never had this before, this is, I wish all owners would do this, has printed me off a document with some additional information that might have been hard to notice had I not been told. But I did think that the wing on the back was quite large and there is a reason for that. It's because this particular car was specced from factory with the Jaguar XKR Speed Pack. Now this cost you £3,500 but what it did was raise the top speed from 155 miles per hour to 174, which actually doesn't sound like all that much for something with over 600 horsepower, but from factory it was just 500. But that's just an ECU tweak essentially to remove the limiter. You can do that with most BMWs that are all limited to 155. So also for your three and a half thousand pounds, the speed pack gave you a new front splitter and a larger rear spoiler, which explains this. Now this was to add drag to the car, or as Jaguar put it, or this document puts it, to counter lift. I like that way of putting it. As well as that, you had body colored seals and rear diffuser and chrome tinted window surrounds, grills and side gills. So that's what you got for your three and a half thousand pounds. But I think all in all, if you're going for an XKR, you're probably quite a fan of the brutish, aggressive look of the car. And with the larger rear spoiler, it only aids in achieving that sort of appearance. It does look extremely aggressive and almost intimidating from where I'm standing. If you've watched any of my videos before, you'll know that I like toys and this car has a fair few on the inside. For me, when I'm choosing a car, a lot of it is to do with the interior and the sort of comforts and luxuries you can expect. And as I mentioned, this one does have a fair few. So let's jump inside the car now, talk about the interior. Of course, we've got two rear seats, so we'll see what they're like too. And then we'll take this thing for a drive and see what that 610-ish horsepower feels like on the road. Okay, so stepping inside the XKR then, and my expectations have to be quite high because it's easy to forget when looking at the pricing of these cars today on the used market. These were over £70,000 back in the early 10s and very late noughties, which is a lot of money, especially compared to the other things on offer on the market at the time. First impressions though are very good. Now the first thing you ever touch when you get into a car is your bottom on the seat. And I'm pleased to report that, as you would come to expect from any Jaguar really, these seats are tremendously comfortable. Although having said that, the seats in my S-Type I've just never been able to get comfortable with. These are not like that. They're fantastically lovely to sit in. And I'm a big fan of these side mounted 
seat controls as you found in this era of JLR product. I much prefer them to the ones down here because although you can learn what they all do, you can't see exactly what they're doing and these are much easier to access. And there's plenty and plenty of adjustability from anything from the lumbar support. The other thing to mention that I noticed when I got into the car is that the doors themselves are held at any point so you can literally open it anywhere you want and they're gonna stay where you leave them, which in this day and age is really, really important because well, cars only seem to be getting bigger and car parking spaces are not. So that's a really nice thing to have. You're not worried about, can you push the door out to its next notch before hitting the car next to you? Because wherever you leave the door, more or less, it will hold for you. Most of the things that you touch in here, certainly as the driver, are good. These leathers on the dash are absolutely gorgeous. The stitching still in fantastic quality. This car has been looked after and cleaned and maintained very well. Everything else you touch for the most part is pretty good in here. Like the steering wheel, it's trimmed in a lovely quality leather. This particular one is still in good condition, along with this Alcantara headlining, which is really, really thick and plush to the touch. Not that you're really ever touching that, but it is gorgeous and you can see it from wherever you are in the cabin. And it's really lovely to have, adds to that feeling of luxury. The paddles on the wheel for the gearbox, which we'll talk about a little bit later, are nice to the touch. And the stalks here for the light and wiper controls also feel pretty good to me. And I love the silver discs on the end, which on this side you use to control your trip computer. And on this, I believe, will be for the washer jets. The buttons on the steering wheel feel really nice to the touch also. On the left-hand side, we have the controls for stuff with our infotainment system. And on the right-hand side, we have our cruise control. That's about it, though, in terms of things that you touch, because once you get into the middle, you're met with some not-so-nice materials. This piano black trim is fine. It's never really something I've been a big fan of because it does get scratched quite easily, although this one has been really well looked after. But these buttons in the middle, these ones here for controlling your driving modes and up here for your air conditioning, feel pretty cheap and nasty's a little bit strong, but they remind me of 20 quid CD players that I used to have when I was a kid. The buttons on them, just really not very nice, not very premium feeling. Dare I say it, this car does have a big five litre V8. It reminds me a little bit of a Ford Mustang, that sort of vibe. Um, they're just, you know, plasticky, very, very functional and fine, but not 70 plus grand. They don't feel like that. And I do find that quite odd with these sorts of cars when, you know, clearly so much attention has been paid to the quality of the furnishings in certain areas and this headlining feels a million dollars, as do the seats, as does this nice felt lining on the cup holder surrounds. But then you just, yeah, touch a few of the other bits and it's just not up to the same standard. And for controls like this to do with your air conditioning, you're gonna be using them a lot. I just wish they'd made a little bit more effort with them. The air vents feel pretty cheap and nasty too and very plasticky. And also if you are familiar with other types of cars, you will notice some things like the wing mirror controls here actually, exactly the same as my Volvo XC90. These are from a Volvo. But listen, I mean, for a car that's now almost 15 years old, it does still feel absolutely fantastic in here. And when you consider the price that you can pick these cars up for, from anywhere around 10,000 pounds and upwards, at that point, at least, it seems very, very luxurious indeed. Let's switch the ignition on then and have a little bit of a play with the infotainment screen because this does have a big central display and there was a fair few things you could do in here. So we have the home button here, which takes us to the main page of this infotainment screen. And on the left-hand side, we have five things we can scroll through. Audio, which is where we can control whether we want to listen to the radio, CD player, iPod, etc. As far as I'm aware, these couldn't natively play music from your phone. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I can see that the owner has had some little adapters installed. So I think that is the case that you need adapters and you can plug them into the USB or iPod port down below to then connect your phone and play music that way or podcasts or whatever it is you might use your phone for. Moving back, we then have the climate menu, which as you can imagine is for all things air conditioning. Now it is great that we still have buttons and a central wheel here to control basic functions in terms of the temperature and air flow. In here, we can do more in terms of exactly where that air is going, and then we can access our heated and cooled seats, which I must tell you are extremely ferocious, both, both ways. Cooled, they're very, very cold, and heated, they're very, very hot, but you wouldn't want it any other way. 
heated wheel as well, which is a nice touch. And I should also mention the steering wheel is electronically adjustable, which as you all know, if you've seen any of my videos, I'm a big, big fan of that and just love that in any car. Moving on, we then have a screen for our phone. And like I say, I don't think you can play music this way. This was just for making phone calls. There is satellite navigation in this car. Now I've not actually used it. And I think for the most part, you would just plug your phone in and use your maps on there. But you'll at least probably know using this that you're in the right country. Then at the bottom, we have vehicle. And I was a little bit surprised at this. I thought maybe there'd be quite a lot of things we could configure in here but it doesn't seem to be the way. We've got all of the trip information on the first screen regarding our fuel economy, our average speed, the distance, and the range left on the car. We can adjust the clock in this screen. We can adjust the brightness of the screen there. System settings, which is just stuff like our audio, how much subwoofer we want, and all that good stuff. And then vehicle settings. This is where I was a little bit like, oh, I mean, there's literally nothing in here. We've got security, parking, we can choose whether we want our mirrors to be dipped or not when we reverse and valet mode but then that only really leaves us with these few buttons down here to configure the car which i was a little bit surprised by like i say i thought we might be able to do a bit more in there we have this checkered flag here which is our dynamic mode now like most cars this essentially just stiffens things up a little bit it makes the throttle response a bit sharper we have a winter mode and we have the option to turn off our traction control using the dsc button here then the centerpiece, of course, if we quickly switch the car on, start, stop button, of course, is this rotary dial, which raises from the center of the car majestically. And it is, of course, our gear selector. Uh, this, if you've had a Land Rover or Range Rover from this area, you'll be familiar with. But unlike in the later L322s with the diesel engine, this is only a six-speed ZF gearbox. And uh, we've got a sport mode on the gearbox too, which to activate, we have to push down this wheel and turn and hold, and it locks into sport, which just keeps you in a lower gear for a little bit longer. In front of us then, we have two lovely analog dials. On the left-hand side is the Speedo with bold capital supercharged lettering above the needle. On the right is our rev counter displaying around a six and a half thousand RPM red line with this five liter supercharged model. And then in the middle, a small central screen with only the essentials uh, that you're gonna need to see. Fuel economy average, how many miles we've done on this trip and our range, which is probably the thing you're gonna be looking at the most because with a five liter supercharger engine producing around 600 horsepower, the range is gonna go down quite quickly once you get onto it. The long-term fuel economy average that this owner has achieved is around 1919 MPG, which well, depends how you look at it, but I think it could be worse. I was about to say, now we can quickly jump in the back and look at the rear seats, but I've only had to just turn over my shoulder and have one quick look to realize that well, that's not going to be an option. I'm only five foot nine and a bit, and I'm in my driving position right now. In fact, I could probably go a little bit further back. And well, as you can see, you're not going to get much in there. Certainly not a human with legs anyway. If you are planning on using this to ferry around young children, then you could actually do that. There is ISO fix too, so you could put child seats back there. But if you're planning on taking a couple of mates down to the pub, even if it's five minutes down the road, it's simply not going to happen. But along with the large rear boot, you can use these rear seats for additional storage for your rucksacks potentially, or very small suitcases. If you're on a road trip, I like to use the rear seats for things like snacks that you wouldn't want to put in the boot, but you don't have to have them in the footwell either because you've got these rear seats. But yeah, in terms of carrying people, uh, it's not going to happen. I'm not even going to attempt to get in the back because I simply, well, I'll never get out. It will break my legs. So with that then, let's pop the engine back on and go for a drive. And to be honest with you, I don't really know what to expect with this thing. I don't know if it's going to be aggressive and leery or if it's just going to feel like a Bentley Continental GT. Let's find out anyway. So foot on the pedal. Let's go. So here we are then in the Jaguar XKR. And thinking back, this is ultimately one of my first ever fast Jag experiences. I've driven a few Jags from time to time and I have an S-Type with a V8, but it's not the S-Type R and it's around 
oh, circa 300 horsepower, a little bit less. It's not exactly a fast cat or a fast jag. And so this one with apparently 600 horsepower or thereabouts, certainly is going to be the fastest Jaguar that I've ever driven. And to be honest with you, I don't think I'm really a fast Jag fan. For me, if I want a car that's really fast, I want it to be quite compromised as well. I want it to be noisy, I want it to be raucous, I want it to be firm. And I feel like the ethos with these Jags is that it's sort of a bit of both. It gives you an element of that craziness, but also a lot of comfort and luxury. And if that is the ethos of this thing, then I wonder if I'm going to like it. So initially, it is extremely luxurious and comfortable. You could be in a Jaguar XJ, to be honest. I'm just in all of the normal modes. Everything is in automatic and the power is effortless. I mean, you could apply a feather to that throttle and it'd be up to 40 miles per hour in just a few seconds. It just glides up to the speed limit without any issues whatsoever. Let's pop the gearbox into sport mode though. That immediately brings us down a few pegs and I'll give it about half power at 40 miles an hour. And there's 60. And that took no time at all. And straight away, there's a really nice V8 note coming from the back. Initially, I'm quite surprised actually at how toned down this thing is. I think if we put it into dynamic mode, will that make it any noisier? I'm not too sure, I can't notice any change it does feel a little bit stiffer trying the paddles there down into second gear and it is a lovely sound but it's not as noisy as i expected i think i or well, heard this thing from behind and it sounded absolutely deafening maybe it's something to do with how well insulated it is in here When you are just in auto and bumbling along, it is genuinely very, very quiet. The steering feels very, very light actually. It's really nice and easy to maneuver at lower speeds. Even in dynamic mode, which I'm still in now, it's very, very light. I know I likened it to one of these earlier and it's the only thing I can really think of that I drove fairly recently that feels similar, but I'm just feeling Ford Mustang with this. I suppose in a lot of way, they're very similar. Great big V8 engine at the front. In fact, this has the same displacement with a lot of power going to the back. Big bonnet in front of you, and it's also set up to be quite comfortable. Uh, reminds me a lot of a Mustang in those ways. And as I mentioned, there's plenty of luxuries. We've got heated and cooled seats. The air conditioning is blowing a lovely little breeze onto me. This Bowers and Wilkins sound system, I've only sampled it with the radio, but it does sound absolutely fantastic and right up to scratch with modern day stuff. We've also got heated front and rear screens. And all in all, speaking of windscreens, the visibility is very good. I can see plenty out the back. Got really big, nice wing mirrors on the side. They look quite sharp and lovely. You can see the rear arches of the car in my right hand mirror there. And behind, I've just got the top of that spoiler coming into my view. It's a nice little reminder of what we're in. So let's see if I can just liven this things up. So we're in dynamic. I'm gonna go back into sport. In fact, I'll do that, but then I'm gonna pull a paddle. Don't think there's any way to keep it fixed in manual, but I'm just gonna pull a paddle and let's just unleash the cap, so to speak. It's a very powerful thing, and although it's got wide rear section tires, 285, I can imagine even on dry day like today, about 20 degrees, it's never really ever going to get all the power down. I mean, I was thinking to myself, it doesn't feel like 600 horsepower this, it doesn't feel that fast. And then I just looked down at the speedo and I couldn't believe the number that was there. I mean, it was 60, obviously, but it obviously is very quick, but because it's so refined and pretty quiet in the cabin, you don't really have any indication of how fast you're going. The brakes feel good, although I am told they are warped the disc slightly, and I can feel some judder under braking from higher speeds, but that's okay. They otherwise feel great. The throttle pedal is not overly sensitive. It's very easy to progressively build the speed without jabbing your passengers' necks. I'm struggling to work out this car, actually, because it is really very fast, really very fast, but it doesn't feel like it. I think 
partly because the steering is so light these seats are so incredibly comfortable the sound insulation in here is obviously of the highest of quality and so it's not very noisy there's not really any sort of noise at all actually when you get on it you can hear that v8 note behind but it's not overbearing and in fact i think i would like it to be a little bit more of a focus in the car i think the v8 power plant in this is so wonderful and such a masterpiece that it's a shame not to hear it a little bit more i think lots of people do minor or maybe more severe modifications to these exhausts and i don't think it would take a lot at all to just bring out that sound a little bit more but then having said that it is the best of both worlds because when you're on it you can still hear it but it is quiet most of the time but i suppose it is set up for the general owner of a jag because i guess it's fair to say that older people tend to be the main market for jaguars or they certainly were in the past and obviously that's who they want to market this car to even the ferocious xkr variant and so you couldn't have a completely overbearing exhaust note for 90 percent of the driving you're going to do in this car and even that i would be doing in this car you're actually just probably going to have it in automatic and you're just going to cruise along and so you don't really want a big noisy drone coming from behind but having said that when i stick it into dynamic and i want to get on it on a nice country road it would be great to hear a little bit more of it you do very much get the sensation that you could drive anywhere in this car okay maybe not up the side of ben nevis but if i wanted to get in it and do a 12-hour jaunt down to the south of france you, you could with these i mean these seats i've not had to touch them at all and they're extremely supportive but it's just the exact right amount of supportive but also comfort throwing it around these corners a little bit more the bolsters are holding me in nicely but not compromising the soft and supple nature of the seats themselves i suppose this car is geared more towards comfort we all know that but with this being the xkr the headline figures were 510 horsepower i was thinking maybe this would be a little bit more weighted towards performance and dynamic ability i mean there were many variants of the xk don't forget and they did an xkrs and an xkrs gt and maybe that has a little bit more of what I'd be looking for. But for me personally, with this sort of power, I want it in a package that is more dynamic and you can feel more and also enjoy it a little bit more with the noise. And so perhaps I would want to just go for a non-supercharged variant or potentially an earlier 4.2 because the most enjoyable thing about this car is its comfort and its ease. And do you need, in this case, 600 horsepower to get the benefit of that? Not at all. I'm sure it all totally depends on the type of person or driver you are and the type of owner. But for me, I feel frustrated in this car because I know how much performance there is, but the way it's all set up just doesn't incentivize me to use it. I just, I just wanna have it in drive and in the comfort setting and just cruise along. So knowing that I've got all of that unexploited potential underneath the bonnet in front of me, to me feels somewhat frustrating. It is also a very fast and capable car though, so there's gonna be an element of it, even with this Jag, that on the UK public roads, you can't really get to the point where maybe it does come alive. As a proposition for value for money though, I mean, if you do want something, because a lot of people do want combined performance with comfort, and this is a fantastic option for that. And then when you look at the prices of these things, it's a kind of a hard one not to consider, isn't it? You're gonna find yourself in the higher tax bracket here in the UK, which I think is near enough 700 pounds these days, if not a little bit more. And fuel-wise, yeah, I mean, I've been averaging around 18, 19 miles per gallon, and it's been fairly mixed driving, probably 70% cruising, 30% pushing. So it's gonna cost a lot with fuel prices and the way that is these days to run this thing from that perspective too. But otherwise on maintenance, I don't think these things are too needy. I'm quite impressed by the handling of the car, although it's quite light and maybe I'd like it to be a bit stiffer, especially in this dynamic mode. You can really sense what the wheels are doing underneath you. 
I just feel a little bit like this car's a bit of a jack of all trades, master of none, in the sense that it's fast, but if I wanted something for sheer performance, then well, I'd choose something lighter that probably didn't have two seats in the back. It's very, very comfortable, but if I wanted something purely for that aspect, I'd probably go and buy a Bentley Continental GT or a long wheelbase 7 Series or Audi A8. And then it's fairly exotic and it, you know, is fairly expensive to run day to day. And so I feel like if you want to go down that road, maybe just go the extra mile and get yourself into a Aston or a Maserati potentially. It kind of doesn't do anything really exceptionally well for me, but as a complete package, it is very, very good. And I suppose if you are just after that one car that can do it all, then this genuinely could be a really good option. Let's try and exploit some of this performance again. So I'm in second gear, I'll just give you an idea of this. So second gear, 20 miles per hour, right? I'm gonna put my foot down, see if the car can take it. That's 60. It, it is jolly fast, it just, it just doesn't feel it. I don't know if I'm becoming desensitized to faster cars or I think it's just the nature of the beast. It's uh, very, well, tame. Don't get me wrong, the back wants to break away and I've got the traction control on and it is getting involved fairly frequently because it's struggling to put all the power down, but I'm not like, I'm not intimidated by driving this thing and I'm not intimidated by putting my foot down either. It's not an engine that needs you to rev it out, of course, either being supercharged. It just has a really lovely amount of power at any RPM you find yourself at. So again, it doesn't really encourage you to push all the way to that red line. This is a really weird one. I can't make my mind up on whether I love this car or not. I mean, to be honest, I don't think I do love it. I, I really like it, but I think it just comes down to that thing of it doesn't really excite me in any particular way. You know, it doesn't make me laugh. It doesn't make me giggle like something else might do. In fact, the Ferrari 360 I recently reviewed, 390 odd horsepower in that thing. Now that makes you giggle every time you put your foot down. Now probably not a fair comparison Ferrari versus a, a Jaguar XK, but do you know what I'm trying to get at? It's just not quite exciting enough for me. And that might just be down to personal preference because I can understand a lot of contexts where something that does all of those things very well is perfect. In fact, most people probably want one car to do everything. And so maybe for you, you might feel differently. I'd be really interested to try out just a, a normal XK, like the 4.2 from the pre-facelift years, because I think maybe I'd like that more. I wouldn't be feeling so guilty for not exploiting all the power all the time, because they are just supposed to be cruised in. And although this is the same, it does have that almighty power plant, and to not be using it just feels like a shame. I want to thank David, the owner, for throwing me the keys to this today. I'm really glad that I finally had the chance to drive one of these. I think I was expecting it to be a little bit more Larry and a little bit more edge of your seat sort of stuff, but it really doesn't feel like that. It just feels like a comfortable armchair with 600 horsepower strapped to it. And I think when I'm sat in my big comfortable armchair, I just want to relax. I don't want to be propelled into space. So thank you all so much for watching. Please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Send me an email at hello at itsjoel.co.uk if you have an interesting car you'd like to see on the channel. Thanks all again. I'll see you in the next one very, very soon.